Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I'm delighted and indeed honoured to welcome to the programme somebody who I'm quite sure will be known to many people who listen to TMR, Dr. James W. Sire, author of such very well-known Christian apologetics books as The Universe Next Door, published in 1976, which has sold over 350,000 copies and been translated into an amazing 19 languages. Also, Scripture Twisting, 20 Ways That the Cults Misread the Bible, and more recently, titles which I suspect are going to be something to do with the things we're discussing today, actually. Titles such as Why Good Arguments Often Fail and A Little Primer on Humble Apologetics. James Sire holds a PhD in English from the University of Missouri and is a former chief editor of the Christian publishers Intervarsity Press. He is, as already mentioned, the author of many well-known books in the area of Christian apologetics and is a frequent guest lecturer at countless universities and seminaries on the subjects of English, philosophy and theology. James Sire, thank you very much for coming on the program. Well, it's good to be with you. Well, thank you for agreeing to join us and thank you for agreeing to come back and join us because I'm going to put everybody into the picture here. We're actually re-recording this interview because last week, exactly a week ago, we recorded the interview and unfortunately my software failed. And I won't say which bit of software in case everybody else thinks, oh, I can't trust that piece of software. Um, So I'm really grateful that you came back on to redo this. Now, we're going to be discussing your latest book, Indeed, I believe you call it your final book, your last will and testament, published in 2014 by IVP, InterVarsity Press, and it's called Apologetics Beyond Reason, Why Seeing Really Is Believing. Now, when I first looked at this title, I have to say, I I didn't know what, what I was going to make of it, because... I thought, well, you know, surely apologetics, that is the intellectual defence and commendation of the Christian faith, surely this is essentially a matter of reason and argument. So what could possibly be meant by apologetics that goes beyond reason? And, uh, you know, the more suspicious side of my character thought, well, maybe James Sire is giving up on reason. But uh, when I read the book carefully, it became quickly clear to me that you're not saying that. You seem to be saying, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to be saying something more like, not that we should despair of reason, but that we should perhaps be giving our limited human reason perhaps a a humbler place than we often do. So perhaps we should start there. What does this rather provocative title actually mean? Yes, but let me correct myself. That may not be my last will and testament. I'm working on a book which I'm finding extremely difficult to handle, and I may not even let the manuscript out of my hands, but I'm trying to figure out how consciousness is a major root of worldviews. Well, if you could figure out the problem of consciousness, the relationship of consciousness to it, the intellect, you'll realize how, how problematic even starting that is and how it may very well not get out of my computer into anybody else's. But... Uh, Otherwise, yes, what you just said is correct. Uh, More and more, older and older as I get, and I'm now quite old, the more I realize that arguments themselves are all based on some kind of presupposition, something that you've accepted without reasoning, and you build on that. And if what you're building on is not true, then what results is not going to be true either. You have to have true propositions in order to have true conclusions, and that includes the premise as well as the other evidence. And the question is, how can you trust these presuppositions, these notions, the first of which is that your mind is capable of reaching true conclusions based on true premises, both of which you have available to you. This is what I call the autonomy of the human mind. And it is the universal presupposition of universities around the world, also of Christian apologists around the world. That is, they accept the value of human reason and the accuracy of human reason, but why should they do so? Only if they start with, number one, true propositions, and number two, the ability to work those propositions out logically and rationally. Do we have that kind of equipment? Do we have that kind of beginning? Or should we just simply rest in utter skepticism, which is one of the alternatives? 
And it's very clear in your book that the foundation for your acceptance of this rational faculty is the existence of God. And you, you call this starting with a God ontology, which of course has to do with the being of God. We'll, we'll get on to that in a little while. There's a lot to discuss, of course, in this. I, I must say, I think it's a wonderful book. But let's not jump straight into the depth of your book. Let's put the focus on you yourself for a moment, because you say in the preface that the book is, and I'm quoting from you here, a strange blending of autobiography and argument and you repeat that in the acknowledgement section as well much of this book is autobiographical you say so let's get a brief sense of that biography how did a boy born on a ranch on the rim of the nebraska sand hills come to be a household name in christian thought and writing how did that happen <laughs> <laughs> the merciful glory of God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next question. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, I, I was born on a small ranch in on the edge of the sand hills, one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. Uh, and very lonely and uh, very much a place where you grow up as an individual. And my dad is a rancher, and I still have that kind of individualist rancher mentality. But I also had very early a sense of curiosity. And one of my curiosities was, can I do something other than work really hard on the ranch and, <laughs> and grow Hereford bulls to breed steers and so forth? And I soon found out, and when I went to the university, that I could do that. I started out wanting to do chemistry, and I did a minimum major in chemistry. But I ran into some difficulties in science, and so I also double majored in chemistry and English with minimum minors in both. English, right after I finished my English degree, I took a philosophy course in the summer, and I was hooked. Plato and Bertrand Russell got me, and I wanted to know how could a Christian thinker think as well as these people and justify their faith and come to understand what the Christian world was all about. After military, I went back and pursued a, a degree in English, a master's, and then a Ph.D. My dissertation was a combination of literature, theology, and philosophy. Believe it or not, it was a subject that was taken up in later literary criticism, a kind of postmodern literary criticism. I was no postmodern. I was very much within the framework of rationality. The title of my dissertation was Miltonic Criticism and the Problem of the Reader's Belief. In other words, what is the role of the reader and how much does the reader contribute to the interpretation or the meaning of the text? Mm. It's very philosophical indeed, and some of those things, of course, you touch on in this very book that we're going to be discussing today. Now, of course, listening to you there, I would have thought that perhaps you would have gone into academia, and of course, to some extent you did, of course, because you have lectured very widely, but you chose to centre your career really in Christian publishing. Why was that? Well, I didn't plan on that. That was really out of the blue, as it were. I got my PhD in English literature. I was teaching already, and then I got a full-time job only at a private college, Nebraska Wesleyan, and I had been teaching there for four years. I kind of wanted to, you know, the young scholar wants to become a mature scholar with lots of high credentials and praise and so forth. Yes. And I was looking to leave the smaller college to go to a larger college. Yeah. And then Jim Nyquist, who is the editor of InterVarsity Press, he said, come on over into Chicago and join us. And I did. I, I wasn't really prepared to be an editor. But uh, I'd been teaching literature and language and so forth. So I thought, well, okay. Was that a big organization at the time? No, 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 no. Mm. Uh, InterVarsity Press in England, which IBP USA is based on, was a sizable institution, certainly bigger than ours. And we had begun a, a very small company doing about 20, 30 books a year. It now does over 100 and it had a very small budget. But after a few years at InterVarsity Press, I wrote a book. Actually, I wrote more than one, but the first one that I really wrote that was serious was The Universe Next Door. That got adopted as a textbook and got picked up, especially when the walls came down in Europe and uh, Christians in Eastern Europe could uh, read Christian books that they hadn't been able to get a hold of before. My book was translated into those languages 
so I got back in the academic world, not so much as a teacher, but as a producer of material that was being taught. Oh, well, let's turn to your book then. Now, you start the whole thing in the preface, and I think you're a bit mischievous here, if you don't mind me saying so. I hope um, so. <laughs> you say that your approach is a bit like Francis Schaeffer, although you do say you, you think perhaps he wouldn't always put things quite the way that you do. So you begin with some what I'm going to call quasi-syllogisms. They look like syllogisms, but they're not really. Let me just speak some of them here, because I, I think they're, they're rather good. <laughs> um, so... The first one is, uh, number one, there is literature. Number two, therefore, there is a God. Number three, either you see this or you don't. <laughs> and then you say, more universally, um, number one, there is everything. Number two, therefore, there is a God. Three, either you see this or you don't. And um, then you have a third one. We, I think you're getting this from Peter Kreeft and Ron Takeli, and this goes... And number one, there is the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Number two, therefore there must be a god. Number three, you either see this or you don't. <laughs> um, now, I love all that because, I mean, it really does make you think, what on earth is going on here? This isn't proper <laughs> logic, but there is something to this that makes you want to read more and more. And, of course, that's what you do. You unfold, you unpack what it is you're getting at here. So why do you express these ideas like this in the form of syllogisms that are not, strictly speaking, syllogisms? <laughs> that's, well, maybe maybe it's uh, a Christian haiku. You either see it or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the idea is this. I call it direct knowledge. And it goes back deeply rooted in Christian theology, because it is a way of understanding something of the transcendence of God and the imminence of God. God creates the universe. He creates us in his image. But everything says something about God. I don't reject uh, natural theology. I think there is a natural theology that is appropriate. I don't think you can reach the biblical God through natural theology, which you could certainly, or so it seems to me, you could certainly reach the notion of a transcendent being that stands behind the rest of the universe. Mm. That would be a kind of deistic God. But the theistic God is the God who makes it, informs us, and tells us about it. So it's a form of seeing nature as a vehicle through which God speaks to us, and sometimes it screams at us. Look, this is so beautiful, it can't be only material. Or, this is so awful that if there isn't something behind it, I can't stand it. Mm -hmm. And how do I explain the beauty if there isn't something behind it? And how can I explain the ugliness if there isn't something behind it? It's kind of intuitive. So our ideas arise in our consciousness. That's what I'm going to be talking about in the next book if I finish writing it. But the first things we have and understand are not reasoned out. They are immediately grasped. Mm. When you're a child, a baby, you don't know anything in terms of putting it into words or language, but you know a lot because you know implicitly without knowing that you know, you know your mother, you know your father, and you begin to say, Mama and Dada, these are arise out of a consciousness if there's something other than you. And over the course of one's maturing, you get a greater and greater and greater ability to access reality directly. Uh, so I think. <laughs> mm. Well, I do agree with you. Uh, the only question I have is uh, how do we justify that intuition. I agree that we do have that. Maybe not everybody does, but I do. So going back to Peter Kreeft's quasi-syllogism there of the uh, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, I mean, I think of the Largo from the D minor double violin concerto, absolutely fantastic piece of music, sublime. It, it's, it's logical, with these long sighs of suspensions and resolutions between the violins. By the way, people, if you haven't heard that, please hear that piece of music. It's absolutely wonderful. And when I listen to that, I do have that sense of intuiting something beyond, which I, who I understand to be God. But then I have to ask the question, how do I justify that as a rational intuition of God? Am I feeling something, but maybe it's just a feeling? Yes, that's possible. And that's precisely what is said by the atheists who only believe in machinery, mm. that somehow 
this has happened, but the explanation for it's happening is that this is just your neurons firing, having been stimulated by some kind of material something or other, light or shadow or music or sound. Mm -hmm. That would be one explanation. But the Christians have at least a voice from beyond that helps them justify what comes without that voice. And this is what I mean. John Calvin, Calvin, early on in his Institutes, talks about a sensus divinitatis, a sense of God. And he states, I don't think you could call this an argument, but he states that there is such a faculty, and it is through this faculty, this built-in, created faculty, that allows everyone to be responsible for what they do with this sense of the divine which they all have. It's not quite the way he argues, but it's the way I argue. It's based in some sense on Alvin Plantinga's notion of epistemology. Yes. But I got to thinking, because you asked me last time, isn't this just the justification for some kind of reasoning? Well, yes, it is that, but I think it's more than that. And so at least in one of my things that I've had published, I say, well, that's what I mean by it, whether Alvin Plantinga means it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let, let me, I think perhaps I need to explain what I brought out last time, um, which you are responding to there. And that is the idea, as for, at least as I understand it, that what Alvin Plantinga is doing, drawing upon Calvin, is he is saying that we as believers have a justification for our intuition of God. Because if indeed God exists then it's reasonable to believe that he would have given us a testimony of his existence via the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, it's, that intuition is reasonable if God exists. So his position really is a defense of faith. But I get the more the impression from your book that you are putting it forward as an argument for the existence of God. And so in a sense, I'm wondering whether your use of Plantinga is a kind of circular use, really. You're, you're arguing circularly, whereas planting it is just defending the rationality of belief. I guess what I'm doing is I'm making an assumption that this sense that I have of transcendence is in fact telling me something that is true. So I'm not so sure it's that much different from planting it. Uh, I didn't think it was that different until you challenged me earlier. And then I've been thinking about it afterwards, and I guess, to, again, I think the best thing I can say is I think it's some sort of direct impact of God on mm. me and on other human beings that allow them to do this kind of mm. uh, foundation yeah. for reasoning. Well, mm. Can you prove the principle of non-contradiction? If you don't use it, you don't make sense. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a necessity. Every argument that's an argument that we would recognize as an argument assumes that contradictions are false. Mm. Why? Because we define truth <laughs> as a conformity of a statement to what it's talking about. There's some kind of conformity there. Sure. So, yes, in the, in the case of logical axioms, then we have a deep sense of dissatisfaction if we go against them. I absolutely agree. And every, well, every reasonable person experiences that dissatisfaction to say, well, A and non-A are both identical, same time, same place. It just, no, that doesn't fit. And I, and I see how that maps onto the kind of thing that you're saying, that we have this intuition of something or someone beyond, and to deny that is deeply unsatisfactory. And I see there's a kind of parallel there. Um, I mean, really, what I think you do in the book, um, and I think it is a, a really very, very interesting book, and I do recommend people read it, is you present your way of seeing reality as see it my way <laughs> um, and you're giving reasons for that but that's absolutely acceptable isn't it i mean wh why should we not argue for the way we see the world in that way I mean, it's not you just say i see it this way and then just throw it out you actually present a whole way of seeing literature a way of seeing philosophy and faith i think you call it a winsome expression of faith and the invitation is See it my way and see what that's like. See if that makes sense to you. So in a way, I see what you're doing less as a rigorous argument, as more as a way of approaching 
evangelism, which seems quite fine to me. Well, when you, when you link it up with apologetics, evangelistic apologetics, hmm. what you try to do, or what you should do, is put in front of people a presentation of the presence of God. Now, you can't do that by saying, I'm God. Hmm. I have a friend who says that that's what she is. She says, I'm God, and then, of course, <laughs> she thinks I am, too. Uh, <laughs> that won't work. But what does seem to not just work, but explain, or what often happens to people in the process of becoming Christians, they suddenly recognize that there's a reality there that they haven't seen before. I'll tell you a story that is not in the book. I once asked one of the uh, people my age in our ancient folks Bible class that I've been teaching, what was their experience that led them to follow Christ? Hmm. And... uh, One of these guys is a scientist. He's retired, too. He went to a private liberal arts college here in the U.S., one of the very good ones, uh, lots of good reputation. Uh, He was given a room with two other guys. He becomes the second person in the room. first person in the room had chosen a particular desk at a particular place in the room that uh, was probably, if you will, the nicest place in the room. A third guy comes in, and he says, uh, looks at the room, and he says, that desk is mine. And the guy who has chosen this desk says, okay. (laughs) My friend Jim, also my name, my friend Jim, it so struck him that he found out a little bit more about the guy being a Christian, and that just led him right in. He saw something immediately of truth in this action, this highly generous action of his roommate. That's the kind of thing that seems to me to be unexplainable by what we normally are. There's something special about this student that he saw it. It certainly is fascinating to think along these lines. I mean, you do have quite a high regard, don't you, for what we might call standard rational apologetics. I mean, you say in the book about many people who have influenced you over the years, and that there are names here that many listeners will recognise, such as Carl Henry, Norman Geisler, Alvin Plantinga, we've already mentioned, Nicholas Walterstorff, who I've mentioned on the, the show a couple of times, William Lane Craig, many times mentioned, J.P. Morland, Alistair McGrath, Tim Keller, and lots of other names. But you single out two names in particular as being particularly influential for you, um, C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton. Can you tell us what's so special about those two characters in your experience? Well, both of them were university people and were not Christians until somewhat later in life. Both of them were Christians not just for, if you will, rational reasons, but for reasons that challenged rationality. Christian faith is full of, well, full might be a little bit too much to say, but there are many paradoxes in uh, the Christian faith and what it says. For instance, transcendence and immanence. How can God, the totally other, the being that is not just the being of the universe, it's a different being. We are so different from him that the totally otherly is perfectly expressible, and there are theologies called theologies of negativity who are really major in that feature. But in addition to those, there is the immanence of God, And there is the demonstration of that in Christ. Christ is the Word, the intelligibility, the meaningfulness, made flesh. And so the transcendent has suddenly demonstrated that it is also imminent. That's something that was beyond the comprehension, it seems to me, of the Old Testament. That is the challenge of Islam. It doesn't believe in the imminence of God in that way. Mm -hmm. But Christians do. Now, how do they tie this together? Well, of course, theologians do actually attempt to do that, don't they? And oh, they try. You know, so, 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 well, uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, but, and, and why not try? And, and some of those people you've mentioned in that list there do, in fact, try to wrestle with deep theological things like that. But, I mean, what you say of them in the book is, I mean, this is quoting from you, the ground that they chose was the trust that modernity placed in the ability of reason to reach true conclusions. And then you say, by way of contrast, talking about Lewis and Chesterton, quoting from you again, The value of human reason for them, that is Lewis and Chesterton, was to permit a conclusion to be wrested from within the framework of paradoxes. 
So I'm getting the impression that you're saying Lewis and Chesterton not, not so much celebrated paradox for its own sake, but allowed those paradoxes to play with the, the audiences who are reading their work and to therefore wrestle with those questions for themselves and that that was important in its own way and perhaps some of these other people who are trying to dot every I and cross every T and are not allowing that connection with those paradoxes in one's experience. I mean, that, that's just how I thought you meant it. Well, yes, I think I do mean it that way. Uh, William Lane Craig would perhaps be an excellent example, but so is uh, Carl Henry. Uh, for one thing, a lot of the theologies that are develop are theologies that begin with epistemology. That is, they begin with, how do we know this? They begin with trying to prove that the Bible is the Word of God, or at least giving lots and lots of reasons why the Bible is the Word of God, uh, rather than to look behind that and say, well, look, the thing that has to be is being itself. There has to be something, actually, there has to be two kinds of things, or two things, the, the known and the knower. If there isn't a, something to know, a knower has nothing to do. So even logically, ontology would seem to be a first thing and then epistemology would be a second thing. And then, of course, there is the ethics, which is a third yes. thing. You say, actually, in the book that you think Descartes' failure to actually pin down that epistemological point of how do we know anything, you know, that first point you've got a reason from, his failure to really pin that down is in itself... An argument for God. I mean, again, you're doing your sort of um, cheeky thing there, but <laughs> that's the kind of thing you're getting at, isn't it? That uh, you've got to start with the being of God. Are rather... you saying Descartes' failure is a proof for the existence of God? Didn't you say something along those lines? Well, I might. I don't know, but that's very <laughs> clever. <laughs> I think you meant it in that mischievous sense again. And I was picking up from what you were saying just a moment ago about, you know, it's ontology rather than epistemology. In the last analysis, you've got to start from being, because something's got to exist, because we can't be certain of our theory of knowledge unless there's something to hold on to. There's some anchor point. And that I got from the book that you were saying that's what Descartes' ultimate failure was showing us, that there had to be some... As I say, an anchor point, some integration point, uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer puts it. Or he also talks about a, a voice. There needs to be a voice that speaks truth into the world, a, a point to hang everything on, um, which, of course, is an argument for revelation, that God should actually speak truth into the world. And we're dependent upon that as a, as a first point of our analysis. Um, I got the impression that's the kind of thing that you were saying there when you were talking about the need for the primacy of ontology. There's got to be God. That's the first thing. That's it, being. <laughs> well, Descartes does that and doesn't recognize it. Uh, he says, I, I, I think. Yes. Therefore, I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's got it there, yes. the premise. I think. And then he concludes, mm. I am. He builds on epistemology, but he's already he's already accepted the existence of the I. Mm. So it's not really a proof in that sense. You see, you have to start with something. Mm. There's no argument that doesn't start with a premise that is not itself proven. And I'm suggesting that the place to go for that is a premise about what reality is. What is is. There has to be is before you can ask what is is, and that's where the Bible, I, I don't know that the Bible was intending this as philosophy, I kind of think it was in one sense, where the Bible starts out, in the beginning was God, period. Mm -hmm. And we're dependent upon that. We have to intuit that in the final analysis, that's what you're saying. Yes, and that intuition is there to be had by every human being. I tell a story of my daughter, when she was five years old, she's in the kitchen mm -hmm. with her mother, and uh, she has this puzzled look. She says, where is God? Well, where'd she get that question? Who knows? But she has already gotten the notion that there is a God, and where is he? And uh, her mother says, well, he's everywhere. And she says, well, is he in the bedroom? And my wife says, yes. Uh, is he in the living room? We had a very small place. <laughs> yes. Is he in the kitchen? And she says yes. And she gets this strange look on her face. 
And she looks up at her mother and says, am I stepping on God? <laughs> so yeah. where, where does that come from? Sure, she has been in the world for five years, and where, where, did, she, where did this come from? It's there. She's conscious of it. She hasn't thought it out. It's just there. I think that she has been, if you will, as we all are, spoken to intuitively, and she's grasped this conception. She's now able to talk about it, and she's grasped this conception. It's puzzling, because if God is everywhere, why don't I see him? Am I stepping on God? She has yet to grasp the fact of transcendence, even though she is experiencing it. Yes, that's fascinating. Because you've already mentioned postmodernism. I'm just wondering to what extent, I mean, you say you're not a postmodern thinker, but I suspect some people would accuse you of perhaps being unduly influenced by postmodern thought. I mean, you say that you've been accused of lots of things over the years, <laughs> of being, uh, accused of being a rationalist, accused of being a, um, a fideist, and accused of being a mystic, um, which is a curious combination there. Um, <laughs> I mean, how, how would you actually define yourself? Well, maybe because I'm confused. <laughs> maybe I'm the one who's a paradox. Or, uh, so that's one possibility. But You're Baroque. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that makes, me, that makes me Baroque. Uh, let's say, ask that question again, because I already forgot what it was. <laughs> oh, no, I was just saying you've been uh, called different things by different people that, oh. that, that, that seem to be contradictory, a rationalist and a mystic. Oh, and a postmodernist. Yeah. Okay, well, here's the part of postmodernism that I think is worth thinking about. Do we create reality by our words, or do we have words that actually reflect what reality is? In other words, is there a connection between words and stuff? I have a good friend, my coffee buddy. He's a churchman, actually the Anglican tradition. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't think truth is real. Hmm. What's true for you could be true for you. Could that be true for me? Does that be true for anyone else? And that the words that we use define reality. I actually don't believe that at all. I believe that in the beginning was the word, not the thing we know, but the word. Now we're talking about God. And the word was God. This is all out of John. This is out of uh, the uh, New Testament. God who sounds very much like a being, is the word, which doesn't sound like a being at all, because words, I oftentimes ask my buddy, uh, show me an idea. Show it to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's much baffled by that and says, oh, oh, I don't understand philosophy. <laughs> well, he's right. He doesn't. But the postmodernist says, no, he's right. There is only material. And we invent words to describe the material, and I don't do that at all. But I'm conscious of language being very powerful, language qua language. Just call me an idiot, and if you mean it, I'm offended. Whatever I am, I'm offended. So there's a connection between words and reality, and if a word is made up and it's a false word, then it's wrong. But it can make you, if you are not strong, all the words people use about you can make you into somebody that you really are not. Now, we all know that Trump is a winner. <laughs> and all the rest of us in the United States know that if we don't follow Trump, we're losers. We're losers. I'm telling you, we're losers. That's all we are, is losers. <laughs> oh, dear, yes. <laughs> you see, we're in a, we're in a particular quandary here. <laughs> I, I can see you're certainly in a quandary, yes. Um, it's amazing how uh, Donald Trump ends up in all sorts of conversations, doesn't he? He seems to be uh, al almost unavoidable somehow. <laughs> well, uh, there was a movement in, in your country to not let him come in. <laughs> Yeah. It, it failed in in, uh, in the parliament, but there was a law put in, put oh, forth yeah. by somebody. This is we got to keep Trump out of here. We don't want anything to do with him. <laughs> Neither do I. But, <laughs> but we are no, but there are a lot of here in the United going. States, you know. <laughs> We've got a lot of old things going on here in this country at the moment, <laughs> yes, actually. actually we do. To say. We certainly do. Um, so it seems to me, then, that you are... The way in which you regard postmodernism is certainly not in a radical sense, but in that sense of a critique of modernism just does not lead you to all the answers. It deconstructs itself, and so we're, yes. we're left with some fundamental questions. Now, um, you talk about 
the relationship between philosophy and literature, in your experience, the two have been intertwined very intimately. And you talk about two cases with respect to this intertwining of philosophy and literature. One is Descartes, who just talked about, and the other one is a Polish science fiction writer called Stanisław Lem. And I love the way in which you talk about this little story that he has, because you bring so much out of that little story, and you allow that story and, and what it is you conclude from that story to show us that our reason is not the be-all and end-all. It's, it's moving in the direction of needing to have that intuition, of, of needing to have that grasping of the reality of a big narrative, a big meta-narrative, which ultimately, of course, is God. Could you talk us through a little how you deal with that story of Stanislaw Lem and what, what you bring out of that? Well, first of all, Stanislaw Lem in his essays, makes clear in a prose fashion that he's not a believer in God, that everything turns out to be material. Mm. But the story he writes is in some ways his way of critiquing any kind of spirituality. And this is the story. He writes a story about a uh, being that arises on a planet on which all kinds of life is dead. The only thing that's around is a bunch of junk. It's like it has been destroyed by some sort of nuclear disaster, and there isn't any life whatsoever. But a jug thrown out of a spaceship flying by ends up knocking some material together, trash, that has been in a puddle, and this begins to form a robot, a mechanism. It falls together, and it becomes a robot, and it walks around, looks itself in a, in a puddle of water, and he says, oh, I'm beautiful, which implies the existence of beauty beyond, that God is beautiful. And then he stumbles and falls back into the puddle, and he doesn't exist for another 314,000 years or so. Uh, and then just do the natural working of the puddle and the stuff that's in the puddle, and another blow from the outside disturbs this puddle, and then what is formed is a mind. This is Mimosh 2, a new robot, excepting he, he has no physical existence. All he is is a consciousness, and he argues for this consciousness. He looks around. Well, of course, he's not looking, but he is perceiving around, and his consciousness does not show him anything else, nothing else at all. Uh, so he concludes that he's God. And he creates in his mind all kinds of characters and creatures. And then after a few years of doing this and having his place filled with creatures that are good, but then another jolt comes into the pond, and suddenly he loses all of his consciousness and he doesn't exist anymore. As Lem says, he never knew of his passing. His consciousness was gone, so he is gone. A completely naturalistic story, but what does it show? Who told the story? Who knows what these creatures that came out of the puddle actually are? They don't know who they are. They're wrong. The creature who has senses and looks at himself in the pond and sees himself makes a judgment that isn't true. How do you know it isn't true? Because Lem says it's not true. How does uh, the creature in the puddle, the, the mind, that is just pure mind or pure consciousness, how does he know anything? He actually is wrong. How do we know he's wrong? Because Lem tells the story. Because Lem is in charge of the big narrative. That's right. This is Lem's world. That's the key to understanding. This is, this is the world Lem creates. Nothing wrong with Lem creating this world. That's what C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton and John Milton and everybody else mm. that writes literature has done. They create their own world. Mm. But Wymosh makes a mistake. He does not know who he is. And the only reason we know he doesn't know who he is is because Lem tells us. In other words, the mind that is just a mind alone is in a box, and he doesn't know it. And my point is that unless there is something outside the universe that tells us, mm. this is a justification for our understanding of Revelation, right. unless our Creator tells us, or unless there's something outside of the world, whether our creator or not, breaks into the world and tells us from the outside, we can't know who we are. So we are like 
my marsh. We're like my we, we have perceptions, we have thoughts, but unless we know what the big story is, and it's only the author who knows what the big story is, then we're we're just looking around and we're rudderless, essentially. Exactly. It's a critique of the autonomy of human reason. Human reason is given to us. Mm. Yeah, but you make a, another step, another really interesting step at that point, because you then say, but Lem, as the writer of this story, is himself living inside a bigger story. Because Lem, of course, is not the creator of the whole universe or is not responsible for the script that is the whole universe. Let's just play with that idea. Maybe that we might think of a script, a big script that is the universe. Don't even talk about God for a minute. Um, Lem doesn't know what that is. He's just an, an author writing a story. So his interpretation of reality could be wrong. And it could be, in fact, the case that there is indeed a God and that there is reason to all beings that exist, in which case Mimosh might actually have been correct and it could be Lem that's wrong because <laughs> there's an, an author of all things who has the true big meta-narrative. I, I, I love the way you bring that out of the story. I guess if Mimosh was the creator... Well, first of all, he wouldn't have originated himself. God does not originate himself. That's the puzzle for scientists, the singularity at the beginning of the, of the world. That means that there's no way to, for us to see from the outside in unless the outside penetrates us in some way. And I argue that the outside, God himself, the creator of the universe, is present with us the foundation that he gives us to trust our senses and to trust our reason. It's God who underlies that and who reasonably underlies that. Without him, we wouldn't have any confidence. The conversation I had with my uh, coffee buddies this morning, I, I, I raised this with a physicist, another guy who's a, also a liberal Christian. He sort of abandoned the argument at the point at which I said that everything that a scientist believes is founded on what can't be proven by science. That is, every methodology of knowledge assumes something solid. It assumes both known and knower, and assumes that the known can be known and the knower can know. And you can't prove that. That's like an auditor checking his own books. And so going on from what you were saying there about that wonderful little story there by Stanislav Lem and the intertwining of literature and philosophy, you actually make what you call an argument from literary theory, which is where you talk about a lot of poems and literature. It's, it's fascinating what you bring out of this. And you seem to imply that we can actually engage God through art, and not necessarily just Christian art. The very fact of its existence and what it says about the artist creating a world uh, allows us to somehow intuit God through that artwork. Uh, you, you have lots of little examples here. Let me just throw one at you, and perhaps you'll comment upon it. You have here um, something that one would not expect to work in this kind of way. It's a lyric by Stephen Crane, and I'll just quote it. A learned man came to me once. He said, I know the way, come. And I was overjoyed at this. Together we hastened. Soon, too soon, were we where my eyes were useless, and I knew not the ways of my feet. I clung to the hand of my friend, but at last he cried, I am lost. Now, I mean, when I read that immediately, I thought, well, that seems such a negative and depressing lyric. But you say things about it that seem to be positive in this sense, that it shows us something beyond what we would expect to read. What do you mean? Well, one thing it shows us is choose your friends carefully. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, if you followed... Crane. Crane turns out to be this kind of a guide who eventually, and then he shows it in this poem, eventually gives up. There is no justification for believing one thing or another. Hmm. You're lost. And that's the truth of the Christian worldview. Without God, we're lost. Hmm. Without knowing the map, we're wandering around in a forest. You see, what I'm driving at here is that I think most people, and I, before I read your book, I would tend to think along the lines of, you know, what would lead me towards God? It would be the sort of overtly positive kind of art, the positive kind of literature. So, for example, you, you bring up the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins, and you quote, for example, from his God's Grandeur. So we have a line like, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And it has that fantastic line, um, 
The Holy Ghost uh, over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. And that, that's so charged with the presence of God somehow that, yes, that's the kind of thing you'd expect to encounter God through that. But then you turn to one of his terrible sonnets, so-called, with its sort of self-loathing last lines like, um, self-yeast of spirit, a dull dough sours. I see the lost are like this, and they're scourged to be as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. You know, and that just breathes despair and self-despair, and yet you say they both point towards God. How so? Well, they're right. Without the kind of assurance that you get in God's creator, you can become a despairing Christian. He's lost something. I don't think he's lost his faith. I think he's just down at the bottom of, of who he is as a human being. He still has this sensitivity that there ought to be, there ought to be, there ought to be. And if there isn't, what's the end? Uh, it's worse than I am right now. If I were the only person in the universe, it's worse than that. So he's he's experiencing that it ought to be like this, but I, I'm not living up to that and this feels wrong. So what are you saying that Hopkins is communicating that sense of it ought to be different to us and we're saying, yes, it really ought not to be like this and, and appealing therefore to the fact that we haven't this deep sense of oughtness That's right. that there should be a resolution to these things. Life shouldn't be uh, as awful as he d- depicts there. And where's that coming from? And that sense points towards God. Is That, that that's what seems to be what you're saying. Well, I, it is, because part of the image of God that we are given mm. is this sense of right and wrong. It's innate. And, of course, you then extend this to non-Christian writers, and you talk a lot here about uh, Virginia Woolf, and it's very interesting what you say about her. And, of course, this is very uh, central to me, um, having been trained as a musician and worked as a musician for a number of years. You know, I had to deal with this question. People would ask me, how come you listen to non-Christian music so much? And I've always felt that, well, you know, why shouldn't I? But, you know, when you start thinking that through, um, the question does become, you know, is it right? to be listening to non-Christian music? Why do I find that fulfilling? What is it about that? And I think some of the things you say here with with respect to Virginia Woolf are very helpful in that respect, that what she writes, even though it's quite negative, quite depressing, still attests to the existence of God. How How do you make that case? Well, one thing is to filter off the content. You can't do this, but you do it for the time being, you filter off the content, which is depressing, and you look at the form. Mm. And the stories that she tells are so artistically told that they have a kind of compelling Mm. reality. And the reality that they compel you to see is this terribly depressive reality. She had a very, very depressing life. She finished her last book, and she filled her gown with stones and walked into the River Ouse. And she just finished a beautiful book in terms of its artistic character. So if you're going to do a good writing, you are Mm. going to do writing that has a goodness that is not explainable by the otherwise despairing nature of the world. So that's the argument from beauty. That's the argument from Bach metal or something like that. But that I don't understand metal. So a lot of this a lot of this modern music I just don't <laughs> understand. I don't want to listen to it. I don't want to understand it. But uh the music as music, if it's music. It made you just jump. I, I yeah. I do get so uh, what you say in this argument. I mean when you look at the the beauty and the artistry of what she's done there i mean you make a lot of jacob's room the book that she wrote and you point to the fact that the way she writes shows that she didn't really think of reality as something tangible she didn't really believe in reality in some ways and that she writes in that very uh, impressionistic way to give that message across it's part of the structure of what she writes I mean, just a little quote here uh, tears made all the dahlias in her garden undulate in red waves and flashed the glass house in her eyes and spangled the kitchen with bright knives talking about the light and the effect of everything nothing was quite real and even more telling you pick out another quote here this i think this is really significant one quote there was a click in the front sitting room mr pierce had extinguished the lamp the garden went out it was but a dark patch 
She doesn't say the light went out. No, the, the garden went out. The reality went out. Deeply depressing. And yet it has a tremendous beauty to it, that writing, a consistency to it within the worldview that she's expressing. And yet when I, I read that, I feel a sense of deep dissatisfaction with her worldview. And that in itself seems to lead me back to saying, no, there must be something more than this. Yeah, for Virginia Woolf, consciousness is all. Mm. Uh, are you conscious? What are you conscious of? You can't know. She's very depressing. You can't know what is. Mm. You can only know what the phenomena tells you. And phenomena is not just stuff. It is your consciousness that makes phenomena phenomena. Phenomena is not data unless language really fits reality. But she would emphasize that it is us who are saying, and us is just consciousness, and that's all. Mm. And she doesn't go beyond that. She can't get beyond that. Can't get beyond it. Although she, you quote from a later part of her life where she seems to be pushing in that direction but still can't quite go there. Let me quote this because I think this is really interesting. Quote, perhaps this is the strongest pleasure known to me. It is the rapture I get when in writing I seem to be discovering what belongs to what, making the scene come right, making a character come together. From this I reach what I might call a philosophy. At any rate, it is a constant idea of mine that behind the cotton wool is hidden a pattern that we, I mean all human beings, are connected with this, that the whole world is a work of art, that we are parts of the work of art. She's almost there. Just about. Hamlet or a Beethoven quartet is the truth about this vast mass that we call a world. And then she says, but there is no Shakespeare. There is no Beethoven. Certainly and emphatically, there is no God. Yeah. We are the words. We yeah. are the music. We are the thing itself. I see this when I have a shock, etc., etc." She gets her almost there. and She won't allow herself to go beyond what it is she is really intuiting. Yes, yes. She recognizes something that she can't actually incorporate. It doesn't work. Not satisfactory. But it's beautiful. Mm. So much of the writing in Jacob's room, this is one of her first uses of stream of consciousness. I think in every novel that she wrote, she uses stream of consciousness, but everyone is used differently. The very first time she used it, I, I really enjoyed seeing how you would write a story without actually being able to tell something that really happened or that you could pretend that it happened. All you could do is to account for the consciousness that you have. It's very, in some ways, it's like uh, you've accepted yourself as God. Mm. You're Maimash, who has no, no actual ability to see reality. You make it up. You're sort of solipsistic. Reality yeah. is your consciousness. If it's in your consciousness, it is. If it isn't, it isn't. The last thing I want to ask you about is the little narrative, the little story that you include at the end of the book. You have a story about a man who has everything. He has a great job, he has a lovely family life, but then his wife suddenly dies. And so he goes on a journey across Europe. It's a cultural journey. He visits the art galleries and he reads great literature and, and he's attempting to make sense of what's happened to him in his life in general. And you lead him through many of the pieces of literature that you've actually discussed in this book. And eventually, through wrestling with all this material, he encounters God. Now, why did you choose to do that? Well, he actually doesn't know where he's going. He leaves his job. He's a better teacher in a college here in the United States. And he leaves his job because his wife has died and he's really lost. He's a deist already, pretty much. He teaches 18th century literature. And he's stuck in that kind of world, and that kind of world doesn't satisfy. His wife is a Christian, and he admires her, and they get along very, very well together. But he's never really seen what she has seen and experiences every Sunday when She's on her knees and takes communion. So he wonders, she's gone. Where is she? Is there anything more? So he's looking for that, and he knows that one of the most interesting places he could find this is in literature, music, and painting. Or he begins to know that. So he visits a lot of galleries, and in each of these galleries, something strikes him. And what strikes him is the reality that they seem to proclaim. He becomes, if you will, a, a theologian and a philosopher. He becomes one who's puzzled and attracted to William Blake, some of Blake's art, which is very interesting, very strange, very interesting. And one of them that really nails him is Goya. 
Francesco Goya, El Prado, and his black period, in which the painting that most struck me, what I saw, was the painting of the pilgrims heading to a shrine, and every pilgrim has the face of despair. It's like they're going to the shrine, but they know that there won't be anything at the end. It would be as if the world were populated only with Virginia Woolf. And that strikes him deeply, because that's where he is. But he's also seen already, and he will see more the, as he goes along, he's already seen the cross. He knows about Christianity. He, he understands its nature and character, but he, he is puzzled by the blood on the cross. Why blood? Where's the reality of that? And he gets to a cathedral, St. Stephen's Cathedral in uh, Kiev, and he sees this painting in which the Last Judgment is displayed. And he looks at this, hell, heaven, Trinity at the top, Mary poking your head out over Jesus' shoulder, the patriarchs behind and the disciples behind, huge painting. And suddenly he says, he, this snaps together for him. And what he's read already in Hopkins makes more sense than anything he's ever seen before. So he has that dramatic conversion experience and wraps himself up in the story. And then when he goes home, and all the way home, he reads Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you say, quote, it was like the last hundred pieces of a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle automatically and suddenly slipping into place to reveal the whole picture. He'd been on this long journey, and then this was things just slotting into place. And you say that he was thinking of a Hopkins poem at that moment, and he thinks of one that obviously... Mary, his wife, knew, and he puts Mary into the poem as he thinks of it. Let me just quote from you. So this is Hopkins' poem that Jake, the character, is thinking about at this decisive moment. Flesh fade, and mortal trash fall to the residuary worm. World's wildfire leave but ash. In a flash, at a trumpet crash, she is all at once what Christ is since he was what she is. And this jack, joke, poor potsherd, patch, matchwood, immortal diamond, is immortal diamond. Amen, Jake said, as heart and mind soared to meet her and their saviour, Jesus Christ. Just marvellous the way that brings everything together. Well, I'm glad you like the story. Yeah. And you lead up to an argument from Jesus. This is where you, you kind of end things. And you, you say that, you know, we've been talking about how all this artwork signals beyond itself. It's like an icon. It signals towards God. And, and now you go beyond that and you say that, well, Jesus is not a signal of anything. He's it. He's reality. We were talking about ontology before, you know, the being of God, and you seem to be saying the same kind of thing here. You, you even say that the argument from the resurrection, which a lot of apologists talk about, you say even that should really be put under the argument from Jesus. We, we should argue from the, the reality, the being of Jesus, to the amazing thing called the resurrection, not the other way around. This is what you're getting at, isn't it? This ontology again. We, we have to start with God. We have to start with the person of Jesus. Yeah, if Jesus is who he is, the resurrection is not odd, not at all, but it seems very odd, and it would seem odd to Jake as well. Yeah. I mean, what you say connects with something that my father has said for many years. He, he doesn't really incline to lots of philosophical arguments about Christianity, but I mean, he has said so many times to me that it, was, it really is simply the person of Jesus. When he reads the Gospels, it's the, the unique person of Jesus that speaks to him particularly. He wouldn't go to looking at natural theology. He wouldn't go to looking at arguments for the resurrection of Jesus as first base and, the, and then say, oh, because of the resurrection, I can believe in Jesus. And I'm quite sure he would say there's nothing wrong in that. But the way he approaches things, he reads the Gospels, and it's the impact that Jesus makes on him that gives him that center to his faith. And you seem to be saying something similar here. Actually, I think I'm saying something exactly the same. Mm. I... I... <laughs> The University Press is going to be bringing out a reprint of a book I wrote 
based on the confirmation classes I taught. I just learned that a few days ago. Uh-huh. And so I've gone through the manuscript. I've already added a chapter, but I was bowled away by the fact that there was no single chapter in that book on Jesus qua Jesus. So I added that chapter. But I taught for seven years in the Presbyterian Church and missed helping the kids see Jesus as Jesus. Well, it's now a chapter in this book. It's not a very long chapter, but uh, shall we say I was astounded. I think I need to ask God for forgiveness for writing that in the book. Maybe he's giving me uh, his absolution by referring <laughs> this with the book with the proper chapter in it. <laughs> But I also noticed how rational my presentation was. The form was the form of Christian theology, rather than the form of biblical revelation. So it's very rationalistic. You're very saying, much so. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that you know that is what's so interesting about your book is that it does give us a a different way, a, a kind of broader way of thinking about Christian apologetics. And I do thank you for that. And I thank you very much indeed for coming to speak with us. Uh, it's really been fascinating. Thank you for writing such a, what I will call a richly thought provoking and indeed challenging book. I mean, you acknowledge that it is controversial. <laughs> Clearly, it's a controversial book. But I, I, I think that's a good thing, because I think it is you know, it gets us questioning the ways in which we do things. It's always good to be challenged. Um, but I, I do think more than that, it presents us with, I mean, at the very least, it presents us with a different dimension to our articulation of the Christian faith to an unbelieving world. It invites us to consider more, well, as you put it, the value of, of doing this, laying before the watching world such a winsome embodiment of the Christian faith that for any and all who are willing to observe, there will be an intellectually and emotionally credible witness to its fundamental truths. I I love the way you put that, a winsome embodiment of the Christian faith. And this book, Apologetics Beyond Reason by James W. Sire, is, of course, available from InterVarsity Press. That's ivpress.com. And I will, of course, put links to that in the show notes. I highly recommend it. it. You may not, if you get this book and read it, you may not agree with everything that's in there, but that is not the point. It gets you thinking, as I say, provides this broader way of considering how we might go about things. So I thank you, James Sire, again, for taking the time to speak with us today and uh, for speaking this second time. It was really, really good of you and a great joy to speak to you thank you thank you that's high praise by the way you you ended up with very high praise <laughs> no i loved the book i really thank did you. when i started i told you before when i started i didn't know where it was going and i had that sort of feeling of mm, i'm not sure about this <laughs> um because of this you know like, like you were talking about those apologists and i thought well i like all these apologists How, why is he saying they're they're not quite up to snuff in some way <laughs> um but you know after a while I, I got what it is you were doing with it and you know especially when you started to get into the literary theory and intertwining that with philosophy and giving this broader picture and of course i'm very interested in planting her as well i just saw the whole thing sort of flower and i thought yeah you're right we've been so rationalistic about our approach for so long there's something to be said for simply showing people and saying look isn't this wonderful (laughs) isn't this wonderful take it seriously essentially and i think it's great thank you i told my wife after our first conversation so you know this is the best interview i've ever had uh he understood my book he didn't mind raising questions and so forth, and uh, I, I, I've been actually fascinated by uh, by how you involve, uh, how you have read it. I wish other people would do that. For the most part, this book has not been picked up. A couple thousand, maybe. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I hope this will be part of bringing it again to people's attention, and uh, I, I hope so yeah, too. Yeah, because I, I hope it'll be. A, yeah, there's so much in yes. there to learn from. And it's very enjoyable to read as well. I kind of think that the negative, uh, your first response, you mean, here's an apologist who's going to go beyond reason? <laughs> yeah. and that may have frightened away a, a lot of people. It could have done. It's not apologetic, but it's really written to people who are thinking about how to, how to respond to the challenges that you get in the university, especially kind of postmodernism challenges. Mm. Anyway, thank you very much. Yes, that's right. It's an excellent book. Um, Really good of you. Really good of you to spend this time again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian. Great to speak to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.